Hello, everybody. Hi, hi. Can somebody let me know if you can hear me? <laughs> What's going on here? Who's who's evil twin? Oh, hi, Trisha. So you can hear me. Good to know. Hello, everyone. And um, hey, Adrian, Tony. Hi. Hello, Sandy and Ruth. I know that you're here and uh, lots of people. So hello from Amsterdam. <laughs> Here's my little pointy finger. Hilary, welcome. Hi, Tish. <laughs> um, awesome. Loud and clear. Geese? Not sure about the geese. I was wondering if you could hear those seagulls. Okay, this is my new pointing finger. So let's get started. We're on the, um, the um, again, uh, just for another week or two. And I wondered if anybody, if you remember, any of you remember this. There is another, this building on the other side of the canal, uh, on the other block on the next canal, also has a, uh, a um, what do you call it? An ostrich. And uh, over, whoops, sorry, over, over there. <laughs> I'm zoomed in too much. As an ostrich over there. And in the ostrich's mouth, is a, horse, a horseshoe because ostriches were thought uh, to actually eat iron for some reason. They don't, but anyway. So I thought I'd just start with that since it's there. Try and zoom us out again. Great, so I've got all sorts of things planned to do. I've got a couple of um, inside sections as well. So I've been inside various things. Hi, Linda. Um, and we are starting with the Hotel Ambassade, the Ambassador Hotel. So um, I am learning so much about Amsterdam on these things because I had no idea quite how extensive the hotel was. So, I mean, this is one of the buildings here. Uh, they've actually got 10 buildings that are used for the, the rooms of the hotel. And uh, you can kind of see inside the window on this one. And nice chandeliers, art on the wall. And of course, you always know it's a hotel from once you think about it, because if you look, you'll see all the curtains are the same, often sort of very fine net curtains. And indeed, a lot of chandeliers in these windows. OK, now the Ambassade Hotel, as you can see here, um, was rebuilt in um, whew, this building was rebuilt from the original in uh, 1750. And then in 1968, it became this hotel and it's family owned and it's still owned by the same family or the same guy. His name is Wouter Schopmann and it's expanded somewhat as well. Now, 10 houses, they have 55 different rooms and the rooms are all different. These, all of these buildings are actually part of the Ambassador Hotel and that one there which is being renovated also. And um, what they've done here is they've maintained the character of the individual buildings. That's been preserved. Unlike, say, for example, the Pulitzer Hotel where you walk inside and you would think you, you would never identify that you're actually inside a canal house. So here's the entrance here and I'm not I'm going to show you a video now and uh, I didn't walk in like I normally did because of guests but this is a video of the ins where's it gone here of the inside so this is just walking in and then turning left uh, it's not playing it is it okay there play okay and uh, the portrait on the wall is um, by Karl Oppel a famous Dutch artist and it's of Theo or Theo Wolverkamp, Wolverkamp. It is a lovely hotel, Marlene. It's great. <coughs> A 
beautiful flowers all over the place as well. And you know, I had some customers last week who, uh, who were staying there and they said the rooms are just great as well. Now you will see there's a lot of books. There are actually 5,000 books um, signed by authors who have stayed at that hotel. Now the owner, uh, Vater, he started collecting books because nearby are used to be anyway a bunch of um, Dutch uh, publishers and when they had authors to stay uh, they would actually put them up at this hotel because it was a really good hotel and then what Walter would do is he would get um, a copy of their book and he would just ask them at the reception um, if they would sign it and they said yes and they often did so 5,000 plus books <laughs> since 1968 and I'm sure, you know, you can ask to, to read them. Hey, Dorna. Yeah, very much so. Um, and of course, there's a whole lot of art as well. So we'll talk about that next. I'll just wait until we're through this room. It is definitely the literary hotel. So it's, you know, where you must stay. And they've had, uh, you know, writers and residents and that type of thing as well. Yeah. Okay, now the artwork that we saw, um, Mr. Skopman fell in love with the art of a particular movement, it's got a funny name, it's called the Cobra Movement. And I think that was, well, it was certainly specific to Amsterdam, but two other cities. Um, and that stood for Copenhagen, Brussels and Amsterdam. And the Cobra movement was quite short-lived. It was 1948 to 1951, so post-war. And there was a real break away from the existing art movements. The Cobra artists really hated naturalism, uh, but they also saw abstraction as kind of sterile. Uh, they wanted freedom, you know, freedom of color and form and to be spontaneous. You can see it was raining the day I was there. And uh, they drew inspiration from children's drawings, okay? And also from Van Gogh and Paul Klee's work. Hello, Suzanne, welcome. Uh, so they've got quite a big collection now, about 800 artworks, and they're still adding to it. And uh, beautiful flowers there. Eh? And this is just walking through the reception to another area. So you'll see some of the art on the walls. And uh, from that period, <coughs> excuse me. And also upstairs, you know, in the, in the dining room and what have you. And this little room here is where I often start my tours. So when I meet people from the hotel, uh, for a walking tour, we come in here <clears throat> and uh, we sit at the little table just on the left and this is where we get to know each other a little bit and do a bit of a, a history overview. It's a really nice, cosy little spot. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the inside of the Ambassador Hotel. Now, there used to be um, a, uh, a gable stone from somewhere else, from the Eichelantiersgracht or Eichelantiersstraat in the lobby downstairs, for those of you who haven't seen my new pointy eyes. And uh, I asked where it was and it's actually moved. It's no longer in the wall. Um, it's actually in the restaurant here. How's about this? So the gable stone is now in a little alcove in a cupboard. But it's a really pretty one and it's nicely restored. So let me show it to you. Um, it is actually Joshua and Caleb and they're carrying a big bunch of grapes. Now they were two Israelite men um, who story is always used to give a good example of faithful commitment to the Lord. So both men came out of Egypt with the Israelites uh, through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And Joshua and Caleb were selected along with 10 other guys uh, to explore the promised land and come back 
and give a report to Moses and the people, and that's what they did. So Hitlan followed Beloften is the promised land, and that's what's going on here. Check out the lovely, lovely wines and the Jewish kitchen uh, cookbook above. No, I'm just trying to get rid of this off the screen. <laughs> no, I can't. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, let's move a bit. No, I'm not, you know, because I've spoken so much about beautiful buildings, Sierra. I didn't even bother with these ones. I mean, there's only so many beautiful buildings I can cope with. <laughs> okay. Let's move a little. Otherwise, we'll be on this block forever. Lovely sky. Check that out. <laughs> you make a lot of wine from those grapes, indeed. <coughs> Okie dokie. <sighs> okay, next up um, is a Renaissance building here, as you can see. Everything is so beautifully restored here, it's incredible. So, <laughs> He's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy. <laughs> okay, thank you for your input, Alex. Uh, okay, so here is a Dutch Renaissance building. <laughs> Oops, and uh, here is a gable stone. And um, there's a mountain with a sun above it. So the house is from 1655, and it was altered and then restored to the original in 1962, uh, which is nice. And um, this one next door is from the same period, but they didn't restore it back to the original. So you can see how the houses were changed over time with the flat cornice. Uh, so this is the, the updated one from the 1700s, and that's the original. And I've got some interior photos, so you can get an idea of what it looks like inside these houses. Uh, check it out. So. There you go. I mean, these tiny little pokey stairways and the attic room. Now, all the, all the usual, um, how do you say, resources that I consult when I'm researching these tours all mention this, all of them, so about from about four different sources. Now, this one here actually used to be a famous brothel uh, run by, and I quote, an old fishwife with a heavy Frisian accent named Altje Turksma. So there you go. These houses have lived, eh? Huh? What hasn't happened in them, I wonder. There's another really sweet little house here. It's funny that these houses are so small, you know, because, I mean, you would have thought if they went up a few floors, uh, there'd be much more space. Check out this pretty little fox. Um, this building is from 1623, and um, it had a, a little a rococo, whoopsie, I'm going to zoom in a bit too much, like a nice rococo gable added, and then much later it had this one added here, this gable stone. And um, this was bought in 1990, and that's when this was added, because the family name of the people who bought it uh, was Vos, V-O-S, which means fox. And the parents bought, bought it as a student house for their daughter and some of her friends. How sweet is that? Nice parents. Um, are there private houses? Yeah, you know, except for the, the ones that belong to the hotel. I'd say some of these seem, from where I'm standing anyway, very much to be private houses, yeah. Uh, although this one looks empty, so oops, I'm about to get run over. It says empty, uh, definitely empty. Yeah, it's being redecorated, so you can try and get an idea of what it looks like inside. A uh, bit too much reflection in the window. Okay. Now. Um, 
try and see if I can show you the top of this one. Um, had a busy day, so I haven't actually walked this before the tour. I was at Kokenhof Gardens today, actually, with the private tour. It was really nice, beautiful stuff. What I want to show you is right on top of this. Can you see at the top there? You can see like that. The zoom works so well, hey? Um, this is a gable with two crossed pistols at the top. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, this was the, uh, the house of an arms dealer called Jakob Ortmann. And his sister was Petronella Ortmann. And uh, for those of you who've been to the Rijksmuseum, and I think maybe Ton and Lee and I years ago spoke about this too, is she is the woman who spent God knows how much money um, creating this doll's house. And uh, she had everything made to size. And I mean, it cost vastly more than many actual houses in Amsterdam. And the whole cabinet is um, tortoise shell with brass inlay, the entire cabinet. And then she's had these rooms made, and as I said, everything was bespoke and actually made um, for this particular doll's house. And what you also get is a woman's perspective. So these doll's houses are quite a good historic record of how houses were used and um, the laying in rooms and the nurseries, because remember, women were often pregnant like 10 times in a row. That was their job. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, she obviously being an arms dealer meant you had pots of money uh, for your family, for your sister, or she probably married quite well, but to <laughs> indulge in these very expensive hobbies like that. Okay, now, where's the chat? There's the chat. Yeah, it is huge for a doll's house. So it wasn't about playing with dolls. It was the equivalent of men who would have um, cabinets of curiosity and sort of uh, ladies like that would have doll's houses. So, oh, you know what? I want to go this way first. So I'm going to head down here and then cross the canal with you. Um, So yeah, lots of nice little houses, and there's a very unusual shop here. <laughs> um, oh, there was something else. Yes, I found an old photo, and I think it's from this angle here. Let's line this one up properly. Um, there was some old buildings here which were broken down. Um, and uh, there was some almshouse court uh, buildings here, and an almshouse courtyard, a hof here called the Houses of Sorrow. Doesn't sound very nice, but this is it. Such an unusual house. That's why I kind of wanted to include this because, look, it's kind of parallel to the canal and set down from the road. Uh, so, oh yeah, Sandy, I think they can be very expensive doll's houses. There's a shop in Monikendam which is stuffed full of just thousands of uh, different scaled uh, items for inside doll's houses. But anyway, that was broken down. That is what used to be here in the buildings you can see there. And that was broken down in 1887. So we're lucky we have a photograph of it because photos weren't from just before then. And then this building here. This is one of the most unusual speciality shops in Amsterdam. The Knopenwinkel. So what's a Knopenwinkel? Well, um, to give you an idea, look at the door handles. I mean, <laughs> so it is a shop um, specifically to sell buttons, okay, <laughs> which is a Knopenwinkel. Let's have a look in the window. And uh, because one cannot live on buttons alone, uh, there's a whole lot of really lovely art. I'm not sure why the building was so low. Donna. 
And these are all originals, you know, so people often ask me on tours, where can I buy some original artwork? And uh, now we know. Okay. And, you know, those are flowers, both the artist, and I'll tell you a bit more about her in a bit, also does sort of these typical Amsterdam scenes. I'm just going to point once more because I'm going to take these off because they're kind of cutting off the blood supply to my finger. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so she also does these sort of typical Dutch and typical Amsterdam scenes, which are really beautiful. Lovely. Let's see if I can line this up properly. So, here we go. <coughs> okay, so in we go. Um, thousands of varieties of buttons, beautiful paintings. Um, if you've lost a button, this is the place to come, definitely. And the lady who owns it, her name is Thea de Boer. And um, she opened a button shop just around the corner in 1986. And then she moved to this one in 2001. So uh, it's been around a while, certainly. Um, yeah, Laurie, there is still an art market on SPO, S-P-U-I. Oh, I forget which day it is. I think it's a Monday. I can't quite remember. Maybe it's a Saturday. Forgotten. <coughs> um, I'll check out all these buttons. Buttons, buttons, buttons. De Boer, uh, B-O-E-R. Um, so, what I think I'll do is in the description of this tour later, um, I will put a link to the button shop just in case you want to have a look. And also to the, um, to the website of the artist uh, who painted the paintings. Now her name is Anna Pavlova and her website is artpavlova.net. But I'll put that uh, in, um, yes, and Thea is T-H-E-A, Marlene, so Thea de Boer. Um, yeah, so uh, Anna Pavlova, artpavlova.net. She was born in Russia and she uh, moved here and she gets inspired uh, by these Dutch scenes. And um, this is one of the outlet outlets of her work. Yeah, it's so nice to have such a, a quirky speciality shop, you know, especially when there's so many shops which have just been lost to sort of mass tourism. I mean, how many more sort of waffle shops and, and sort of cheap telephone accessories do we need, you know? So this really is how it should be. Um, glad that it exists. Come and support it. Uh, so it carries on existing. And great artwork, you know, it's really nice. Okay, so here we go with that. Oops, off the screen. Okay, now. Across the way here are some very grand houses, as you can see. I'm zoomed out a bit too much. Let me just zoom in a bit. Get straight in front of them. Okay, so how's that for a, a chunk of real estate, huh? Now these are called the Kromhauthausen uh, because the f name of the family that made them or had them built. So have a look at them. We've had a look and we'll go and across the other side of the canal to have a closer look. <coughs> the family name <coughs> of the person uh, who had them built was Kromhaut. Uh, so he actually bought uh, four plots and made two double houses. So the two larger ones are a house together and the two smaller ones are a house together. Um, 
He used a, a Catholic architect. He was Roman Catholic and he used the really famous Catholic architect called uh, Philip Wingbaums. And the style is Dutch classicism. Okay. And what Wingbaums did is he was actually the creator of the Dutch neck gable, which you see here. So the central part at the top is like a neck and uh, it's lent itself to decoration on each side, uh, sort of, which would really lend itself to the whole classical thing. Let me get inside, try and I'll zoom in and tell you what I'm, show you what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, here we go. So there's the neck there. And then this is what I mean about the decoration on each side, these volutes. So he was the, uh, uh, the master of Dutch classicism. Now he lived here from, uh, oh, actually no, he lived. Whoa, whoa, sorry, I should actually look around walking and then just settle and then talk. Okay, let's do it from here. Um, he lived until 1669 and he bought these in 1660. So um, he didn't get too much time to enjoy his beautiful houses. Um, and the family lived here for a couple of hundred years. Okay, so that's quite some time. It used to be open as a museum and now it's not, unfortunately. Uh, so the whole house was a museum before. It used to go in here or here, I can't remember. Um, but what happened is that um, it was uh, bought in by the Stutzherstel, so that's where you can see this uh, little thing here, which is this wonderful organization that looks after um, historic properties. And of course it is built out of stone, and you know what that means, is that the Cromhart family was showing off that they were absolutely filthy rich, because every single piece of stone here uh, had to be imported because we ain't got no stone in the Netherlands that is strong enough for building houses. Okay, now, sort of jumping around on the story a bit. Let me get my, get my story straight. Um, <coughs> it was the Bible Museum until uh, 2020. And when it became, when the Bible Society took it over, and that was in 1877, they actually had to reinforce the floors so that they could take the extra weight of all the Bibles. Can you believe it? Now, I used to, I went to the Bible Museum a few times. It was up in the attic and um, it was really interesting. And then, of course, there was the, uh, the museum in the house below, which showed so many beautiful rooms. Somewhere on some external hard disk, I will have photographs and stuff of like that, but I just have no idea where at the moment. Um, so it's not accessible anymore, however the ground floor and the garden are still accessible. Uh, so when this was given to the Stadtshörstel, it was on the condition that the ground floor and the basement rooms and the garden remain public access. So we can all still enjoy this beautiful home. And here is, a, and it has this magnificent, um, staircase it's famous for it so this is walking straight in from the door up a corridor like they all have and then just check out check out this beautiful staircase the staircase came much later actually this was from 1719 this oval staircase going up a few floors it's so elegant absolutely great And like so many of these buildings, you know, beautiful, beautiful stucco, plaster work, lovely marble work. And here's going downstairs. So this is anyone can come in here. And uh, there's one of the original kitchens just coming up on the right. With a chandelier, of course. I mean, everybody has a chandelier in the kitchen, no? And check out this oven over here. It's a really unusual door. Oh, 
Oh, thank you. Oh, awful waffle. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually done without a gimbal, so a lot of this camera stuff, you know, is just handheld. But, you know, after years of doing this, we, get, we all get a bit better at it, I, I hope. Okay, so there's a cafe inside rooms on either side, and then also outside. So if you come here on holiday in Amsterdam, this is a lovely place to have lunch, especially in the warmer times. This pond here, you see there's a... Um, how you say, you can walk across the middle of the pond. This is a reference to Moses passing the Red Sea, because remember it was owned by the Bible Society. And I don't actually know anything about these unusual pieces in the garden. I can't tell you anything about them, I'm afraid. Um, but they're interesting. <laughs> <Okay>. <coughs> so I thought, well, well worth a look. Probably something biblical about them. It's a lovely garden, and um, in the garden they have trees of biblical significance. So they have a date palm, a Judas tree, um, a fig tree, and a mulberry tree. And here's a crest. So this is an old gable, you know, from the top of the building. Again, sort of taken into the garden, which is just so great because you can have a really close look at it. Normally we don't get so close. <laughs> and then just to look back, and yeah, it's the back of the house with yet another eagle. <laughs> so you see, I've been busy filming this week. <laughs> okay. <coughs> now, this is very subtle here, uh, this gable stone here, but it's a piece of uh, crooked wood because bear in mind, the, uh, the name of the owner was Kromhout, which means bent or crooked wood. So that's why that is there. Oops. Oh, hi, Ben, from the Charge Show. Welcome, welcome. Uh, the stone, by the way, is Bentheim sandstone, so it's the same stone as the Royal Palace and um, the, uh, how do you call it? the trip house, but it's not as stained from the years of pollution, which is, I mean, and also these houses are really quite remarkable. I mean, let's just zoom in and have a look at some of the detail of this. Right up at the top there. Okay, now, as so often happens, well not so often, it's happened twice. <laughs> I've been all excited about talking about a building and then lo and behold, uh, it becomes covered with scaffold. <laughs> and that is what has happened here. Luckily, I, uh, I didn't find out now. I, I found out earlier in the week. <laughs> so uh, I feel like Patrick and Aaron and scaffolding. But let me just tuck myself out of the way here because I have photographs of it. Isn't that a beautiful scaffold? <laughs> okay. But let me get a picture of the house up. So here we go. Now, I mentioned to you uh, when we were looking, I think it was last week, at the Delhi building, you know, with a beautiful 19, early 1900s interior. I told you the story of a particularly nasty man, um, Jakob Nienhaus, uh, who was actually thrown out of Indonesia, but he owned that company. And um, he had this house here constructed. Well, actually, that's not into Well, let me just get, not skip around. First of all, I've shown you the wrong picture first. So that's what it looks like, okay? But there were houses here before, and he had them renovated 
and the renovation was just, just, just coming to the end. Uh, so they were reno renovated in Louis XVI style, and then they completely burned down. Uh, so here is like the big one, um, here are the four houses basically, the one flat corniced one and then the two uh, with the neck gables to the right of it. Completely burned down, I mean what a tragedy. Um, and it was winter time so you can actually see the, uh, the ice from the, the water that was used to try and put out the fire. It's all frozen as well, so it's bitterly cold. So at that point it became, you know, not feasible to then um, uh, to repair those buildings and then they were broken down and then replaced with this one here. Let me just zoom in so it fills more of the screen. Um, now this style is called Françoise Première or François Première, uh, François the First and uh, it's in Oberkirchner stone and it's reminiscent of French castles and also of the Vanderbilt um, mansion on Fifth Avenue New York City that was probably also an inspiration. Now let's just check out some details underneath here and you'll see what I mean. It's very unusual. It's unique in Amsterdam that has this crazy amount of details all over it. Like that. One day we will revisit this again um, when I can get closer to it. Um, so this absolutely kind of remarkable detail. It's such a shame that it was such an appalling man uh, that had this fantastic taste. And I've also got some photographs from the city archive um, that I can show you some close-ups of. So let's just look at this over here, a close-up of the outside. <coughs> now when, um, when this opened, find something else to fill the screen with something interesting. Oh, here's something interesting, so I'll show you half of that. And then half fill the screen with that. That's a bit of detail. Okay, in the local newspaper, this is what was written when it opened. Um, they were talking about the style being Francois Premier style. The flowery, opulent style, which is the expression of a rebirth, of a blossoming after hard struggles and much hardship. When the towers, the feudal castles, Grim in appearance and inwardly the image of cheerlessness had served their purpose, the Renaissance came to replace them with pleasure palaces. In that sense too, the house bears the stamp of the century that in distinction from the quiet, stately character of the other mansions next to it, it more clearly displays the opulence of its inhabitants, the finely chiseled carvings and lace make the facade an inexhaustible delight for the eye and the smallest part of the decorations has been carried out by the artists with a love that testifies to their artistic sense and to their inexhaustible patience of the builder. How's about that uh, for glowing uh, praise? And here's a bit of external detail. Okay, and I've got a little bit of inside stuff. I wasn't allowed to film in the actual building, so I'll just cut that a little bit in the entrance, and then I've got some photographs which I've put into like a reel. So here goes. Um, okay, so heading in, and this is where the coaches would drive right through. 
So you could drive in with this coach and then through these second doors here and into the rear coach yard. And then turning left, if you visit Amsterdam, these will be open. You can come in, you can turn left, you can say hello to the concierge and he'll let you look at this interior stairway and take photographs of it, but no filming inside. <coughs> and it goes up, there's actually the most remarkable uh, uh, sort of round ceiling window, which unfortunately I couldn't take a photograph of. This is some detail around the stairwell. It's all in metal, by the way, because this was um, 1890. It was the time of the Industrial Revolution. And every room, not every room, but the rooms inside are lots of different uh, styles. You know, there's uh, Moorish rooms and so, all sorts of things. So it's really, really beautiful. Um, now, from 1921, uh, there's not much point in showing you the scaffold, so I'll just cross the road and show you yet another beautiful boat going by. From 1921, uh, Deutsche Bank, so the German bank, Deutsche Bank, had that as their Amsterdam branch. And um, after the Second World War, as German property, it was confiscated. And then in 1946 and 1947, they used the building as a place where they had tribunals uh, to try collaborators during the war. Okay, and look at the, how the sun is catching on top of the buildings. And um, since 1997, uh, it's been home to the Netherlands Institute for War and Holocaust Documentation. And then since uh, 2010, it's been called, it's kind of changed name, it's the same organization, it's called the NEOD Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. So it's an unusual building in that it had such an appalling first owner, yet it's uh, been used subsequently for such important things. Oh. I love the way the sun is just catching the top of these buildings now. Hey, Mary Ellen. Yeah, it is beautiful. So, okay, which brings us to the end of the lollipop and which means that it's now time for the quiz questions. So only answer if you do not have a slicey. Um, now the quiz question is, uh, Earlier, at the Ambassade Hotel, the hotel is famous for its book collection and its art collection. And the art collection is of a specific period of art that the owner particularly liked. And that period of art had a specific name based on the three cities that were the main players of that period of art. The cities are um, Copenhagen, Brussels and Amsterdam. And what was the name of that movement of art is the question. In one word. Won't be funny if I just seen if we saw these boat go. This is one of the types of boats that Lee Skipper is. So I mentioned an art movement at the beginning. Uh, the Ambassade Hotel has of art that is of that movement and more. And what was the name of it? Ah, Laurie. Laurie has the answer, which is the Cobra movement. Um, I always need to double check the chat, which is only available uh, tomorrow or after 24 hours to see if anybody else answered first, but I don't think so. By the way, please like the video, like the thing. You know what I mean? And if you could um, make a comment under the actual video once it's live on YouTube, that would be really awesome. YouTube likes that apparently. And I like it too. Okay. <laughs> so, um, thanks for joining everybody. I see there are quite a lot of people on board and I much appreciate it. Uh, of course, in the links, uh, description, buy me a coffee, all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, Laurie, you just uh, contact me and I'll get that winging its way to you. Um, and uh, 
Oh, look at the lovely colors. I'm actually gonna um, show you. I'm gonna actually just show you this a bit longer. Really nice. Now, so I'll stay here just a bit and just uh, try to enjoy the, uh, get some good shots of. Hey, Todd. Get some nice reflection colors on the canals. <laughs> oh, thank you, Linda. Thank you, thank you. And uh, so what's coming up? I think the next one is next Monday and then the week after maybe sometime during the week I'm actually going to be in Kokenhof or maybe that's two weeks away, I'm not sure, <coughs> with you. Oh, that's on the 17th. So that's going to be the one day uh, that I can show you around the gardens. I've got to remember where I parked my bicycle. <laughs> Somewhere around here. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks for joining and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye.